This topic is near and dear to my heart. It really upsets me. I mean, it just makes me mad when we, as buyers, come up with a great new invention, a great new idea, and somebody in China or even back home steals the idea and profits from it instead of us. Now, granted, China doesn't have a good reputation when it comes to intellectual property protection, but the good news is that things are changing, and changing fast. I think the change is happening for two main reasons. One, China has now been part of the World Trade Organization for over a decade, well over a decade, and in exchange for enjoying the benefits that come with membership in the WTO, um, China has to get serious about intellectual property rights. So that's one reason. Um, the other reason is that as more and more Chinese factories move up the value chain away from being just the factory of the world to actually developing their own designs, having their own brands, in other words, now that the Chinese have some of their own intellectual property protect, suddenly Beijing gets more serious about intellectual property rights in China. Well, you know, let's just take a step back. There's still a willingness to cut corners by suppliers if there's a chance to make a bit more money. Just look at that section on quality control to see how corners can be cut. Um, but I'd like to give you some examples where cutting corners actually endangered the, the lives of other humans. Um, early on when I came to Shenzhen, I remember sitting down and watching the evening news and it was in Chinese so I had to ask my wife, I said, hey, what, what are they really saying? It sounds like they're saying, um, don't get into ambulances, um, that you should check if the ambulance is real or not. And actually that's what they were saying. At the time, there was a rash of fake ambulances, vans that were decorated and looked just like a regular ambulance, and these drivers would monitor the police scanners when there was an injury, someone was in a car accident, for example, these guys would get there first. They even had what appeared to be a nurse, maybe she was registered, maybe she wasn't, in the back of the van. They would get you in the van and then extort you for a ton of money when they got close to the, to the um, hospital. So believe it or not, at that time, you even had to verify if the ambulance was legitimate. Um, to take it fast forward to uh, some modern examples, you know, this year, uh, 2014 and now 2015, um, this issue of gutter oil isn't going away. This is a nasty um, money-making proposition where certain people will take the, the rubbish oil, so say there's a factory, not a factory, a restaurant that is frying food frying vegetables. That oil goes out the back door, sometimes into a big drum, sometimes literally into the gutter, and there are other companies or individuals that collect it and sell it back to other restaurants. Sometimes they're even putting in them into um, you know, cooking oil bottles for home use. Totally disgusting, totally unsanitary, people died from this, um, but there was, there was a rash of fake gutter oil going around. Fake oil, meaning from the gutter. All right, um, also recently we've heard about some uh, pollution spills in the major rivers and fish have been known to be collected from those dead fish, from those spills and sold to the market very quickly to make a buck. So people out there are thinking that they're getting fresh fish and it's actually died of chemicals and other nasty stuff available at the market. So right now in 2015 there is a big push by the central government in Beijing to um, help ensure the quality of the food products. You know, this is stuff that people put into the human body. Okay, um, I'll give you another real example of, of where corners can be cut that can endanger human lives. Um, I was working on a project where we were importing American uh, chicken products into China. Um, they were frozen and distributing it across the country in China. And we worked with a partner and, for the logistics. And suddenly we started getting really high bacteria counts, the quality of the product was going down, and we couldn't figure out why the product that was imported into the country perfectly, no problem, five days later it, it was uh, showing up in, in shelves at our distributors and retailers um, with problems. It turns out that the third party that we hired to do the shipping, meaning the trucking at that time, refrigerated trucks, their drivers, in order to save a little bit of money, would turn off the refrigeration after they left the warehouse and just before, like a couple hours before they got into the distribution center, they would turn the refrigerator back on. So for sometimes up to a day, that meat just sat in the back of the, uh, of the van warming up. Really scary stuff, but it demonstrates that you know, people are willing to cut corners. Um, why am I telling you these stories? You know, so if certain business people in China or other places are willing to clearly risk the lives of their fellow man 
Do you think that they're going to worry that, worry that much about something as intangible as intellectual property rights, especially when those intellectual property rights belong to some foreign entity on the other side of the world? Come on, not really. Now, let's take another step back. It's not just about ethics or the pressure to make money. I honestly believe that there's something cultural going on as well, and I'll give you an example. The first time I realized something was different was when I was an exchange student in northern China, up by, uh, in Manchuria, towards uh, Russia and, and uh, only a couple hours away from the North Korean border. But it, it was a great place to go to school at that time. And I remember the first day, um, I went to the dorm, I came to the dormitory, I met my roommate, I unloaded my stuff, I went to the cafeteria to, to uh, have my first bowl of rice in mainland China. And when I came back to the dorm, my roommate had uh, all the stuff that I brought from my bags scattered about on the desk. He was going through my personal effects. I had a, a, a computer at the time, that, which not too many people had then, and he was going through the pictures. And when I opened the door you know, and, and stepped in, I thought he would say, oh, I'm sorry, and you know, put things back, a bit of embarrassment. But the actual, exactly the opposite happened. He actually yelled out the door, since it was open, hey, everybody come in and check out this stuff. And pretty soon I'm surrounded by all my Chinese doormates going through my stuff in great detail. And it realized that, hey, maybe, maybe it's um, because we're in a tight environment, maybe there's some difference, meaning tight meaning lots of people into a small space, maybe it's a, a different balance of what is personal and public, but I knew from day one that something was, was different here in China from back home. Um, later on in my career, I remember I was driving through town in, in the city of Shenzhen, and I looked over and there were five Hunan restaurants next door to each other. So five restaurants in a row. And then on the next block down, there were three pet supply stores in a row. And then there were five or six hardware shops all next to each other in a row. And it really struck me that day that, that um, you know, there, people in, in China, there's no negative connotations with taking somebody else's good idea and jumping on the bandwagon. Now as buyers, if you're buying hardware or pet products or want Hunan food, you know, that's good because there's a lot of competition. But if it's your idea that's being knocked off, you know, that we have to be careful. We have to find ways to, to protect ourselves. So I don't know whether it's communism, Chinese culture, a lot of people packed into a small space, but there definitely is a different mentality in China about what is in the public domain and, and what is private. Um, I've got a hundred examples to give you, but I just live, give a couple more to close. Um, I remember, this is about probably seven years ago, and uh, at that time I, I really wanted a, a BMW 4x4. No way was my wife going to open up the pocketbook, but I was walking through and get... Uh, Alright, let me start this section on... I've got hundreds of examples about how intellectual property is, has been compromised in China, but let me give you a few more just to make a point. Okay, uh, first situation I remember, I was walking through a second tier city, maybe a couple hours out of Shenzhen, and this really cool car came up next to me. At first glance, I thought it was the BMW X, at that time they were called the X3, now the X5 is out and such, but at that time the X3 was really new in China. But I also understood that it wasn't available yet, so I was kind of surprised to see this, this X3 BMW uh, in this second tier city. And then I, I walked over a little bit closer to the car, and I looked at it again, and on the back it said CEO, like S-C-E-O as the, as the tag, not the BMW logo. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. BMW has a joint venture with a Chinese car maker to make a model of their X3 in China. But then I kind of got closer and looked in the window, and as the guy parked, I talked to him about it. And it turns out it had nothing to do with BMW. And BMW actually was pretty pissed that a Chinese car manufacturer stole their whole body um, componentry. So I'm not saying that the, the uh, engine was BMW, you know, but the styling, the way it looked, at a distance, you know, from a couple meters away, I thought it was a BMW. <laughs> so, hey, BMW got knocked off in China. Um, my next example involves some fake eggs. Believe it or not, I was having breakfast at home, you know, once a week on Sunday mornings, I like to relax with a little American-style breakfast, some bacon. I was cracking open eggs, and as I went to crack this one, it kind of bounced back, and I thought, oh, that's odd. So I peeled off the, um, the eggshell, and inside was like this gelatin. Now, it didn't, have, it didn't smell like chemicals. Of course, I didn't eat it, but um, it turns out, I did a little research, and at that time, 
there were some companies that were making fake eggs. Now these eggs, basically they would suck the insides out of the egg, use it for something, then put fake gelatin back in it. Now keep in mind that at that time, a whole dozen eggs was like a few pennies American. So somebody realized that there's quite enough volume in China that they could make a living producing fake eggs. So what I'm trying to tell you with these two examples, if you're sitting here saying, oh my, my product um, is, is too complex for the Chinese to knock off. Think again, you know, BMW <laughs> was knocked off in China. Automobile is very complex. The Chinese put a man in space a few years ago. So it's not a question about technology. Can they knock it off? Um, and if you're thinking, oh, my margins are so tight, you know, look at what are the margins on eggs? Yet even Mother Nature was knocked off in China. So long story short, regardless of your product, if you have something proprietary, we need to protect it in China. And let's bring up slide number one. We're going to cover four things. How to register your intellectual property in China, how to limit your exposure to being knocked off, how to monitor your intellectual property rights, and how to enforce those rights if push comes to shove. Okay, first let's talk about the registration process. Um, if you only remember one thing from this session, I hope you'll remember this. China is a first to register, not first to market system. That means the first person that takes the idea, gets it down on paper and delivers it to Beijing, they own the rights to this idea. Even if another party had been active in the marketplace buying and selling this product for years. So that's very different from places like uh, certain parts of North America and Europe where if you can show that you were in the marketplace first, then basically the intellectual property is yours. The opposite happens in China. Whoever fills in the paperwork first owns it, and if you're on the wrong side of that decision, you face a very steep uphill battle to try to regain your intellectual property. The good news is that the process is very straightforward for registering intellectual property in China. Um, now, it's not quite as straightforward where you and I as foreigners can fill out the forms and submit it online. You still need to appoint a um, Beijing-approved patent attorney, a representative that for a small fee will do the filing for you, but at least that process is very straightforward and can be done in, in English. With their help, they'll translate things, of course. And also, it's affordable. You know, to register a logo, a brand, we're talking you know, maybe thousands of dollars, not tens of thousands of dollars like in the US or Europe. Um, okay, so where do you want to register, where do you want to register your intellectual property? I think there are three places. First, you want to go to the patent, obvious, patent office, obviously. You know, that's in Beijing and uh, you will need a patent attorney to sort that out. In a later section about third-party service providers, we'll talk about how to hire and um, pay a lawyer in China. Okay, also a lot of buyers forget that the Chinese government is trying to crack down on counterfeits and protect intellectual property rights much more now than they did 10 years ago, for example. So you can actually go to the port authorities and demonstrate, show them a piece of paper that says you own this technology or you own this brand name. For example, Disney probably has a team of, of lawyers that go to all the ports in China and show, okay, these products are from approved vendors who are authorized to put the Disney logo on the product. You can do the same. You can work with the port authorities to um, enforce who owns the uh, technology or the brand, what have you, the intellectual property. Okay, also people forget to bring this issue up with their suppliers. A lot of uh, Americans might turn over a long detailed contract that has some um, terms about non-compete, non-disclosure, intellectual property, but if you don't explain it clearly to the supplier, they might not respect it, let alone understand it. So it's important that you register your intellectual property in the mindset of the uh, China supplier, the China factory. So here are some ways to do it. Even before you share these ideas with the supplier, you want to get a non-disclosure agreement in place and uh, there are samples of a non-disclosure, non-compete clause um, in our templates uh, folder that you'll find. We'll go over that a little bit later. Um, also, visit the section that we did on contracts. We talked for a while about how to um, control the situation so that not only does the supplier understand your, your desired terms about intellectual property or quality or what have you, but respects them. So go back to the section on on uh, contracts, you might want to watch that again. Um, also, another way to ensure that the supplier um, respects your intellectual property 
is to present it in a way that they can't forget and that they will lose a lot of face if they violate these terms. For example, um, when I place my contract or my purchase order, attached to that purchase order is a copy of the terms and conditions that we signed regarding non-compete, non-disclosure, who actually owns the intellectual property, and so on and so on. That way, the supplier is looking at it every time the order goes out. I think it's a bit dangerous to sign a, you know, your terms and conditions up front that state your your non-disclosure, non-agreement. Maybe you say, all right, I don't want you to deal with these five competitors. If you get that on paper up front, it can't hurt. But over time, the supplier might forget about it. You know, you're doing business with a supplier for a long time. It was, it was fresh in their mind for the first couple orders, but after order 10, do they really remember what are those five competitors that you wanted them to promise not to do business with? So actually remind them with each contract. If there's money flowing, it's a great opportunity to remind them about the promises that were made in the past. Also, we talk about leveraging face. Um, it's very good to get a commitment from your supplier um, in front of his employees. For example, if a factory owner says to you, oh, don't worry, we won't deal with Walmart USA. We understand that you're in competition with Walmart. However, you're going to be our partner for the American market, so we promise not to sell to Walmart. Now, Grant, that should be in the contract, of course, but if the manager says that, or the factory owner says that in front of all his peers, and then someday he actually does start doing business with Walmart, he loses a lot of face, his coworkers, you know, people that, that, uh, that he has to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis see this person as someone that is, is not uh, willing to stand behind their word. Okay, now let's talk about ways to limit your exposure to knockoffs, uh, meaning how to prevent copycats how to prevent other people from stealing your ideas. Um, and I think we should look at this in two phases, both the pre-production phase, before the order actually starts, or even before you've selected the supplier, and then we'll look at ways to protect your ideas after production has started. Okay, in the pre-production phase, um, if we go back to our slides in early session, you know, where do you go looking for suppliers? Online, at trade shows. Um, I'll give you a story that might scare you a little bit. I had a, a friend, he was Chinese, he owned a factory, and he always had really cool products. And I visited his factory one time and I said, hey, you know, where's the R&D room? And he showed me this little, little room with no employees, no computers, just like a, some paperwork in there. And I thought, that's strange. A couple days later over beers, I asked him again, I said, hey, you've got these cool products every year, you get the new stuff before anybody else does, yet you don't really have an R&D center in-house. How do you do it? And maybe because he had a few drinks, he told me the truth. He said that his company goes to trade shows. I said, what do you mean? Well, of course they go to trade shows to find new customers, but they also collect information. You see, it turns out a lot of buyers from overseas fly into China um, with the mandate from headquarters back home that they've got to find a supplier in the next week while they're in China at the trade show. So they fly in with all their blueprints, all their the information needed to make the product so they can get an accurate quote, and they go around and give this information to 10, 15 potential suppliers. Then at the end of the show, they maybe pick one or two suppliers to deal with. What about those other 13 or 14 suppliers? Well, my friend was one of those 14 suppliers. He would take the ideas. If he didn't get the order, he would go to Beijing and register it first. So the trade shows became a way for the Chinese factories to collect information about, hey, what are the cool products that are selling overseas? Long story short, before you show up at a trade show with your, with your um, product information, first, you better register your ID in China. Um, second, you should consider doing an RFQ with maybe a dummy product. For example, um, take something similar to your idea, but it doesn't have the secret sauce. Go out there for quotation purposes, you know, get your multiple quotes, and then before you share, after you narrow it down to two or three suppliers, then you get a non-compete, non-disclosure agreement in place and you might show your secret sauce to a, a narrow group of suppliers that you feel confident in. Okay, now let's talk about limiting your exposure at the production phase. You've already found your supplier, you're about to hit that order. How do you protect your interests? How do you ensure that you're not overexposed? Okay, first is you need to ask yourself the question, who has access? Who am I dealing with? For example, if you're dealing with a manufacturer or dealing with a trading company, it's very different. With the manufacturer, okay, that's the place of production. You know, they have real assets on hand. When you sign a non-disclosure agreement, if they break it, 
Um, they have a little bit more exposure than a trading company that might not have much physical infrastructure. So if they break the terms and conditions, if they violate your IP and you take them to court, they don't have as much to lose. So know who you're dealing with. Also, if you're dealing with a trading company, are they willing to tell you where the production place, where the, where the production is taking place? Because if you don't know where production is taking place, how are you going to monitor it later to ensure that there's no backdoor production or that your um, ideas aren't being knocked off? Um, also, if you're dealing with a factory, it's also important you talk about this issue of outsourcing. For example, you know, as we mentioned in an earlier session, sometimes factories, when they have a busy um, when they have a busy season and they don't have capacity, they might outsource the product. Now, if your product is proprietary and you have some protection of the intellectual property, you don't want just anybody getting their hands on the on the uh, critical information, like how to produce it, what does the packaging look like, all that sensitive stuff. So you might want to have some agreement in place with your sub supplier about outsourcing in order to protect your intellectual property. Okay, another physical way to protect your intellectual property is to compartmentalize the product. For example, let's say that you're, um, you're in electronics and you have some secret sauce um, software that goes in some off-the-shelf hardware. Well, maybe you would have the hardware come from a traditional supplier, then perhaps a, a, very, a smaller or a secure partner, perhaps even back home or in China, that would do the final um, insertion of the software onto the hardware. This falls under the category of black box assembly, and if you type that on Google, you'll find some service providers that can help you set up this third-party assembly. One of the advantages of having a third party do the final assembly, not only to protect the intellectual property, basically they keep the sub suppliers at arm's length so that the sub suppliers don't see the finished product, they don't see your secret sauce, but also if a third party is assembling the product, they should also uh, do a quality check at the same time. If they're touching it in order to put two parts together, they might as well make sure that those are the right parts. Okay, um, another way to limit your exposure is to own the tooling outright. Um, if, for example, you have a proprietary product, it's something that's highly customized, you, know, you want to own the tooling that's used to make your product. So if, God forbid, that factory abuses your relationship or starts to knock off your product or sell it out the back door, um, you can legally, with ease, pull the tooling. And we talk about tooling in, I think it was the, the session on contracts. But I just wanted to remind you that owning the tooling is a physical way to control who has the ability to make your product. Um, also consider the 30% rule. I found over the years that if I have, if my purchase equals roughly 30%, you know, 20 to 30% of the factory's output, that makes me a key customer and the supplier is, is more likely to consider the ramifications of, of uh, violating my intellectual property rights. So if you're uh, too small with a large factory, and then another buyer comes that says, hey, I like that technology, I'll buy a huge order from you, it's more tempting for the, um, the seller to um, you know, go ahead and, and do business in a way that violates your intellectual property. But if you're the right size, with the right size supplier, you have a little bit more leverage and they think twice about knocking you off or not. Okay, um, as we mentioned in a um, earlier session, you know, if the price is too low, there usually is a catch. And in those earlier sessions, I was talking about how when you get a low price, perhaps you're getting low quality. But I've also seen this relate to intellectual property. Sometimes these very large factories might give a low price in order to get your order, in order to basically reverse engineer the product, learn the technology. Um, so, you know, if, if a large factory says they're really interested in your product and they give you a, a really low price compared to other factories, you know, th think twice about it. There might be some, some catch. Okay, let's talk about how to monitor the intellectual property. And what I'm talking about here is, you know, physically monitoring it. How do we keep an eye on our suppliers and the marketplace in general? Okay, so um, what are we monitoring? We want to see if our suppliers or the marketplace are making available the products that we believe are proprietary for us. Um, now, now, where do you monitor it? I, obviously, at the factory. Now, one way is for the frequent um, audits and inspections to keep an eye on things. Um, other ways are a little bit more covert. For example, you know, 
You can hire investigators that go to the factory. Um, you know, some of them even will get hired as an employee, go into the factory and keep an eye on things. Um, an easier way might be to hire a third party that kind of monitors what trucks are coming in and out of the factory and where they're going to, to ensure that uh, no knockoff parts are going out the back door. You know, those are fairly expensive um, ways to monitor the factory and might not be applicable for all of our audience members. So let's talk about some of the affordable ways to monitor um, if our suppliers are being honest and if our products are in the marketplace when they shouldn't be. Okay, so um, first off, there's trade shows. You know, you would be surprised at how many suppliers sign a non-disclosure, non-compete agreement with a buyer, basically promising that they won't sell the product to anybody else, yet they take a sample to a trade show. You know, maybe they're trying to show off what they could make or something similar, but you don't want your product sitting on the shelf ready for sale um, to another buyer who may your, be your competitor. So if you don't have time to go to all the trade shows where the supplier exhibits, notice, know that you can hire third parties who will basically walk the show and take pictures and make sure that your product's not available on the shelf. Uh, another thing that you want to monitor is the brochures and the sample room of the supplier. Um, also, I talked about in an earlier session when we were talking about factory visits, I mentioned how you can get a lot of information by keeping an eyeball on the warehouse and the tooling room. For example, if you go to the factory's warehouse and you see on the labeling for all of the packaging, I'm talking about the master cartons, that this supplier is shipping to your competitor, you know, that's a red flag. If you see you ordered 100,000 units and you go into the warehouse and it looks like there's 200,000 units sitting around, that's a red flag that your supplier is selling your product to somebody else. Another place to look is in the tool room. Let's say that you place an order for 10,000 units over the last six months. And now during a random audit, you or your representative are at the factory. Go take a look in the tool room. Um, you might, especially if your product is proprietary or customized so that this tooling belongs to you or is at least used for your order. If you place 10,000 units and you look at the wear marks on the tooling and it shows that it's been used to make 100,000 units, that, that's a red flag. Also, if you haven't placed an order in a few months and you see that the tooling is greased up and sitting in the machines running parts, Okay, that's a red flag that, that somebody is knocking off your product and, and selling it uh, in an unauthorized fashion. Okay, um, another way to see if your suppliers are being honest is to use a dummy customer. You know, have a friend or perhaps a coworker operating under a different email, um, you know, under different business cards. Contact your supplier and ask to buy your product and see if the seller will respect your non-disclosure, non-compete agreement. You know, if the supplier says, sure, we'll love to take your order, and you've just signed a comprehensive agreement about how this product is proprietary and will only be sold to you, you know, that, that's a big no-no and a big red flag. Okay, so those are ways to limit your exposure, to register it, and to monitor it, but how do you enforce it? Let's say that, God forbid, you find out that the supplier is knocking you off. Well, um, you'd be surprised to learn that demand letters actually work better in China than they do back home in the U.S., for example. Um, you know, sometimes you send a demand letter in America and it, you know, it's just ignored. In China, that actually works. I'm not sure what are the reasons. Um, maybe it's because the, the seller is just surprised to learn that, okay, you actually know about it. So um, a demand letter, if well-crafted, meaning it's in bilingual, from a rep, it needs to be in Chinese. Um, and it's from a reputable law firm that scares the seller a little bit. Um, you know, they, they might come clean. Perhaps they'll apologize. There's going to be a little bit of loss of face on their part. Whether you want to continue doing business with them or not is another discussion. But a demand letter in China, it, it does work. Also, um, you know, if you have a contract in place that has the terms about um, these intellectual property rights, who owns these rights and it's violated, you know that if it does come to litigation, even a foreign company in China can win against a Chinese party. Um, you know, see the section that we did on contracts to, little, to learn a little bit more about what are the costs involved and how does it work. But I'm here to just tell you that, hey, demand letters and litigation, you know, they work in China. The, the best part about going to court in China is that just like labor costs, the costs of a lawyer are also reduced. So instead of spending you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars to fight a court case in China, it might be tens of thousands of dollars. It's like you're rich and can hire the dream team almost. So I'm, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but these court cases, you know, they're not as painful as it is back home. 
And uh, I'm happy to tell you in, in the vast majority of, course, of cases that I've been involved in, the foreign party has won, mainly because we had clear contracts and we used investigators rather than the police. We used investigators first to collect all this information to um, catalog the infringement. Then we went to the police and showed them. So we made it really easy for the police to say, hey, this is a clear violation of the contract. It's clear counterfeiting. I'm talking about the Chinese police. Okay. So I, I just want you to remember two things. China is first to register rather than first to market, and you can win in a Chinese court of law. So don't be afraid to enforce your rights in China.